How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and told him your hearts in secrets? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? How long has it been since your mind felt at ease? How long since your heart knew no burden? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? How long has it been since you knelt by your bed and prayed to the Lord up in heaven? How long since you knew that he'd answer you and would give long night through. How long has it been since you woke with the dawn and felt that the day's worth a living? Can you call him your friend? Since you knew that he cared for you. How are you guys today? Good. You had a good weekend? I guess. Yes. You guess? Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's hard to decide. There's a lot of memories I can't remember and I don't want to think. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to play a game called Who Do You Trust? And I hear that this used to be a TV game show. I trust nobody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, the, the purpose of this game, the Who Do You Trust, is I'm going to ask a question. I'm, first, I'm going to ask you who you trust to answer the question. I think you already know the answer to that. <laughs> All right. So. She said it. 
I have a question about a television. So, Will, who do you trust to answer that question about television? Oh, Preston it is. All right. <laughs> All right. So, Preston, who is green and lives on a trash can on Sesame Street? <laughs> You forgot his name. Anybody want to help? Oscar the Grouch. Yes, good job. <laughs> All right. So now, Chase, I have a question about the Bible. Who do you trust to answer that question? The Bible. That's a good answer. But among you guys, who do you trust? <laughs> oh, am I on our roll three of us? Yes. Uh, four of us? Me. You trust yourself? Yeah, I don't trust her at all. I don't trust any of her. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Don't bite my fingers. Well, let's see if any of them know the question, and if not, you can answer it, okay? Mm -hmm. Who got swallowed up by a big whale? Uh, I don't know this. A person. A person? <laughs> How about Will? Who, who is it? Jonah. Jonah, yes. <laughs> all right, so. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> the game Who Do You Trust can be fun, right? Yeah. But yes. also in life, who do you trust is an important question. Me. And the Bible answers that question. Can I answer that question? Go ahead. God. God, yes. God, so, Jesus, or me, and or myself. <laughs> so do you guys... Not you. Nope. Do you guys know the Psalm 23rd? Do you know what that verse is? No. Say that again. It's Psalm 23rd, do you know that verse? It's a verse. Okay. Go ahead, Will. Well, I know, but I have memorized it. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, right? Oh, yeah. Do you guys know what a shepherd is and what he does? Yes, yeah. What is it, Chase? He makes sure the sheep don't get away. Sheep don't get away. And also, at my school play, I was a shepherd, so <laughs> it was so hard. I wish I never was. All right. And shepherds so being a hard job. I just wish it wasn't. <laughs> I wish it was so easy. I could just watch them all day and relax or go to sleep. <laughs> all right. So, sing me. so I know. You're welcome. The shepherd takes care of the sheep. So if the sheep is hungry, it takes the sheep to where they can get something to eat. Okay. If it's thirsty, it leads them to water. If it's in danger, it protects them. And did you know the Bible says that we are sheep? Yes. yes. And that Jesus is our shepherd? Wait, yes. We're animals? <laughs> So we should be outside right now. We're mammals. So no, we're outside no, mammals. We're mammals. We have hair. So, so that means when we get hard choices in life or we need assistance. So we live in the water? He's talking. We can always count on Jesus to help us and protect us, right? You can count on me and then. All right. All right. So you guys can always remember that to help you through life and difficult choices. You guys want to join me in prayer? All right. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For being our shepherd. Being my shepherd. And leading us. And leading us. And helping us. And helping us. When we need assistance. When we need assistance. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You guys can go ahead and go ahead back to your seats now. <laughs> the Bible reading for today is 1 Peter 2, 19 to 25. If you want to follow along in the Pew Bible, it's in the New Testament on page 233. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness by for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed for you were going astray like sheep but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning again, church. Today we continue in our sermon series, A Living Hope. And the title of the sermon this morning is Guardian of the Soul. And I want to start by asking a question. Why does a good and loving God allow suffering? That is a question many people throughout the ages have asked. Some have tried to answer this question, yet, at least from my perspective, and, and maybe yours as well, no one has really come up with a satisfactory answer, a completely satisfactory answer yet. For example, Rabbi Harold Kushner, in his widely read book, Why When Bad Things Happen to Good People, he concludes that God, while benevolent and loving, God is not omnipotent. That is, God is not all-powerful. In other words, God does not have the power to stop suffering in the world. Now, I hope for many of us, this is not a satisfactory answer because part of our core beliefs is the omnipotence and the all-powerful nature of God. Could it be that when it comes to suffering, that the wrong question is being asked? In this text, Peter clearly does not question why God allows suffering, and instead acknowledges the reality of suffering in this world and how one can understand and respond to this suffering. In the first verse uh, of this text, Peter relates something that uh, I think you will find, and I know I find, completely contrary to human nature. Peter says that suffering unjustly is commendable. Does that make anyone uncomfortable like it does me? What in the world is Peter saying here? Most, if not all people, and including myself, do just about anything we can to avoid suffering, right? I, I know I do, and I would guess that every, you do everything you can to avoid suffering too. So why would Peter say suffering unjustly is commendable in the eyes of God? Well, he goes on to say, because Christ also suffered. Christ suffered for you and me, leaving us an example so that we should follow his steps. Now again, the idea of suffering still seems strange to the 21st century mind. But I want to remind you to let us not forget the times in which Peter was writing and teaching this concept it was a time when Christians faced persecution, often very, very severe persecution, and even death. And I call to your memory the sufferings of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul suffered beatings for his faith in Jesus. The Apostle Paul suffered being put in chains and put in prison for his fervent teaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. And yes, Paul ultimately suffered execution for his faith in Jesus. There's no doubt that the Apostle Paul unjustly suffered for his faith in Jesus. And this is the kind of unjust suffering Peter is teaching is commendable in the sight of God. Now, I think you can hardly disagree that Paul definitely followed in the footsteps of Jesus. And Peter is encouraging those who face suffering unjustly in our time to follow in the steps of Jesus. Now, I'm going to say it one more time. This is not a message the masses want to hear. Quite frankly, I'm not sure it's a message I want to hear. And yes, there are probably Christ followers who do not want to hear this message either. 
Now, thankfully for us, we live in a time, in a place today where Christians do, face, do not face much persecution. We face little persecution, and rarely does that persecution ever lead to suffering. But I think we're also aware that in places like China and in some Middle Eastern countries, Christians are unjustly suffering because of their faith in Jesus. They suffer from the same range of things that Paul suffered. They suffer beatings for their faith in Jesus. They suffer being imprisoned for their faith in Jesus. And yes, some are even martyred for their faith in Jesus. In fact, some believe that more Christians have been killed for faith in Jesus in the 20th century than the first few hundred years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Suffering for faith in Jesus is not something new. Suffering for faith in Jesus is not something most of us want to hear. Major League pitcher Dave Dravecki, who I remind you suffered the loss of his pitching arm to cancer in his prime, puts it this way. He says this about suffering, and I quote, In America, Christians pray for the burden of suffer suffering to be lifted from their backs. In the rest of the world, Christians pray for stronger backs to endure the suffering. Peter also teaches something that's difficult. He, he writes, for to this you have been called, to suffering we have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. We have been called to suffer for Christ Jesus. The question should not be why do bad things happen to good people, but the question should be how do we respond to the suffering which we are called to. Peter calls Christians to respond to suffering unjustly in the same way that Jesus did. And as you heard read, when Jesus was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Our response to suffering unjustly is to do as Jesus did, and that is entrust ourselves to God, the one who judges justly. Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. By the way, Chase, where's Chase? There you are. You said you didn't want to be a shepherd. Well, you know what? I don't want to be a sheep. <laughs> I'm not sure I don't like being called a sheep. You know why? I grew, up, I grew up on the farm, and one of my uncles raised sheep. And let me tell you, sheep are the dumbest animals on God's green <laughs> earth. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have gotten off track. <laughs> but we are. We are like sheep who have gone astray. But now we have returned to the shepherd and guardian of our souls. You know, our call this, 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 to worship this morning, you may recall, was the 23rd Psalm, one of the best known passages of Scripture in the whole world. And it's a beloved text because it gives us a, a mind picture, if you will, of Jesus as the good shepherd and guardian of our souls. It reminds us that Jesus is there, even in times of suffering, to care for us, leading us to green pastures that we might eat, leading us beside the still waters that we might drink, and leading us in the right paths. 
And even when the suffering is so bad, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we have nothing to fear because Jesus is with us. And Jesus avenges our unjust suffering by preparing a table before us in the presence of our enemies, that is, those who persecute us unjustly. He anoints our head with oil and our cups run over. And even in suffering, we need to remember that goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the assurance that we have. The assurance that we can trust in Jesus as the guardian of our souls. You know, my explanation, the one that I accept for why there is suffering in the world is simply because we live in a broken and fallen world where sin, sickness, suffering, and death still have sway. But rest assured that even though we may suffer unjustly at times, our souls and our future are secure because Jesus is the guardian of our souls. Amen. I send you forth now from this sanctuary as the people of God, a people of God who may wonder why bad things happen to good people. But you know, I guess I've resigned myself to understand that we probably won't know the answer to that until we step across the threshold of glory when God reveals all to us. But until that time, understand that Jesus suffered for us and his followers are called to do no less in suffering for him. 
So go forth and boldly, despite what might come your way, go forth and boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, that there is a better way than what the world has to offer, and that is following in the footsteps of Christ. Please be seated, and after the postlude, depart in the peace of Christ.